Hello, my name is Alex Marshall, and this is a presentation about hybrid energy for sustainable cities alongside the IDEA 2024 conference. When deploying sustainable energy technologies in the city context, one must also consider the energy trilemma, i.e. how you balance cost, resilience of power supplies, along with sustainable energy. Different types of organisation will feature in different parts of this triangle, depending upon the specific organisation and also the geogra geographical location at which they operate. So, for example, a data centre is going to be very uh, keen on ensuring high levels of resilience and uptime. Campus institutional organisations may be willing to trade some of that towards um, reducing carbon. And then other organisations such as CNI space, the commercial industrial space, may be more concerned about cost reduction. When considering distributed energy and how that fits with sustainable cities, there's a number of different factors you can consider. Firstly, energy efficiency. If you're going to use a valuable fuel, such as uh, biogas or renewable natural gas, or alternatively even natural gas, ensuring the most low, highest levels of efficiency is going to be really important to ensuring that you have the lowest carbon emissions. Keeping the lights on is another component of sustainability, so we need to make sure that the, what, what power supplies we have coming on are resilient and able to um, keep the lights on when, when there's challenges with the grid or for extreme weather events. As we move to a net zero future, the energy should ideally come from renewable energy sources, and those renewable energy sources can in parallel match with the agenda for sustainable waste management. Uh, typically, renewable energy is thought of as solar PV or uh, wind turbines, which are driven by intermittent sources of energy. On the biogas side, that can also support the sustainable waste management agenda, i.e. generating uh, electricity or generating renewable gas and in parallel treating organic wastes, whether they be wastewater treatment plants or from uh, municipal sources. Next, with the intermittent renewables coming on, we must also ensure that the lights are kept on, so enabling renewable energy by providing flexible sources of power for when the wind isn't blowing or sun isn't shining. So these can take the form of gas peaking stations, whether they be natural gas fueled or alternatively hydrogen fueled or, or renewable natural gas fueled to give a fully sustainable solution. And then finally, a lot is talked about carbon, uh, carbon capture at the centralised scale, but at decentralised level, there are a number of different options available to recover carbon uh, and utilise it in, uh, as, as a source of uh, CO2 directly in things like soft drink manufacture or alternatively stabilising it into a form that could be used as paints or into papers. The final element which should be considered is sustainable data i.e. all sustainable cities now require large amounts of data processing power, and they're typically done on off-site locations for data centers. With the move towards um, intermittent renewables and the electrification of both heating and also um, transport, there is a greater and greater strain on the grid. The grid doesn't have the capacity available to uh, provide to all the data centers. So data centers are now looking to generate their own power close to the site of use. So data center power consumption is set to re reach 35 gigawatts by 2030, which is double the 2022 levels. Um, now, if that data center is using a source of fuel on site, so a, a gas source, for example, it's important that energy efficiency is considered uh, and that heat is utilized. Now, these are large sites, and if they're synergistically linked to district energy schemes, you can greatly improve the efficiency and greatly reduce carbon emissions. And in parallel, they can be fueled by renewable fuels, such as renewable natural gas or hydrogen. When looking at microgrids and hybridized power sources, uh, I'd like to explore how that looks both electrically and thermally. So electrical microgrids, or electrical grids even, are driven to a greater degree by intermittent nature of solar and wind power, which is growing exponentially, which is great. But the sources of those uh, fuels doesn't necessarily match the end user needs, i.e. when we turn the lights on, it doesn't necessarily correspond to when the wind is blowing or sun is shining. For um, localised sources of power, there's then the need to balance that uh, intermittency, and that can be done with energy storage, but energy storage doesn't generate power. So when you have what the Germans call the Dunkelflaut, i.e. the time of the wind, the time in the winter when the wind isn't blowing and sun isn't shining, and there's no energy to drive the wind turbines or electricity to the solar, where does that come from? That can be backed up by gas engine technology, which can um, be fueled by renewable fuels or natural gas and can be used. Historically, it was used in a 
uh, base load configuration. More and more we're seeing that move to a flexible generation technology. And then as absolute backup to ensure that full resilience, then they're available, you fall back towards um, backup gen sets, which can be fueled by diesel sources or, or renewable diesel, such as biodiesel. And all of those types of technology can then be integrated and optimized using microgrid controller. What's talked about less is the thermal microgrid, i.e. we often think about the need for generation of electricity, but we don't think about our needs for heating and cooling. For uh, the CHP engine, a combined heat and power engine, the electricity can be used to directly drive heat pumps, which will in turn generate a renewable heat source. The heat from the engine can either also be fed into the heat pumps to drive them in a reverse mechanism, or alternatively can be fed into an absorption chiller to generate cooling loads. So with the different sources of electricity and heat, um, you can then start to uh, s solve the challenges with, with localized need for thermal energy and cooling energy. And all of that is buffered in uh, thermal stores, which is similar to a battery, but on a thermal level. When we look to the building blocks of decentralized energy systems, technically, you can consider both the generation of the fuels, you can consider the utilization of the uh, energy itself, and whether that be on the electrical or thermal level. So this diagram shows the different sources of renewable power or renewable fuels that go into the system. Uh, they're shown in green and they range from biogas, renewable natural gas, hydrogen, uh, and then wind and solar energy, uh, along with biodiesel. The generation of those fuels can also occur within sustainable cities. So if we're looking to um, the utilization of organic wastes, so human waste or alternatively the waste we produce in uh, food manufacture or in the kitchens, those organic materials can go into a biogas plant to generate biogas. The biogas can be cleaned up further into renewable natural gas to decarbonize the, um, the, the gas distribution network. And then more and more, we're also looking to electrolysis. Electrolysis itself generates hydrogen, but needs a surplus source of electricity. Those can then feature into the wider microgrid, both electrically and thermally, with wind and solar power uh, generating intermittent power and in, in parallel being stored into uh, batteries. And then you can look to combine heat and power technology, which uses some of those renewable fuels to generate electricity and heat close to the source of use, along with potentially um, cooling loads. And then finally, all of that again is integrated with that kind of microgrid controller at the, at the center of the system. What is a microgrid? A lot of people call a microgrid different things. So from a definitions perspective, this is important to consider from where we're coming at it from. Firstly, a basic microgrid i.e. this can be a single source of um, generation linked to a local load. So a simple microgrid may, for example, be a combined heat and power engine in islanded mode. Moving the complexity higher, if that central power generation source is then complemented potentially by solar, that then becomes a simple microgrid. On the next level, adding a battery gives a great deal of extra flexibility because it enables the time shifting of power. We call this an advanced microgrid, and that battery enables the time at which the generation source is, 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 is pr pr produced, i.e. from a solar uh, farm or from wind turbines, and then stored and dispatched when it's needed. Either that's for the facility itself, or alternatively when the grid needs it for, for backup services. And then we go to complex microgrids, and they are higher multiples of generation sources, so combined heat and power, batteries and solar, and they be linked and decentralized and combined together in greater levels of complexity to, um, to, to, to be all be optimized together. It's important to also consider how these generation sources are controlled, and there are two main strategies, either centralized control or distributed control. In the centralized control, you have a single central brain optimizing all of those assets individually. In a distributed controller, the brain sits on the assets themselves, and those assets then talk to each other, or those brains then talk to each other. Now, both of them have strengths and weaknesses. There's a high level of complexity in distributed control, but there's no single point of failure, i.e. if the central brain has a problem in a, de in a centralized system, then the whole system is challenged. In a distributed control, if one of those brains is knocked out, those, the, the remaining um, control systems can still see and talk to each other and optimize and correct any, any challenges. There's also two different levels and two, two different approaches to look at control. It can be top down or bottom up. So from a bottom up situation, such as the Ineo Yambaka controller, that comes from the asset level itself into the higher levels of functionality into the grid dispatch. Whereas the decentralized control, such as Hala, looks at the, um, the higher levels of functionality, but doesn't typically go down into the device optimization. And the benefits of these two systems can be used in isolation or combined together, depending upon what the needs of the customer is. 
So when looking at the development of a microgrid itself, we found there is a need to offer a greater scope of uh, supply, i.e. we're moving from providing a CHP system, a combined heat and power system, um, whereby we understand this, the customer's electrical and thermal needs and model on a single engine solution, along with after sales support and commissioning, to a microgrid where it takes on a lot more understanding of that site's operation. So you need to then go into the actual understanding of how a for example, a commercial industrial facility, or alternatively a district energy scheme, needs electrical and thermal energy. And if it's an existing system, how we monitor and understand that site's needs and get a better level of intelligence to map on a power generation solution. And then with the advent of artificial intelligence and machine learning, we can then translate that to a um, ongoing optimization of the microgrid to enable a better more cost-effective, more carbon-efficient um, solution for that particular generation asset or that particular system. When looking at carbon dioxide recovery at decentralized level, we can look at this either from a pre-combustion or a post-combustion, i.e. before it's been burnt in a power generation source or a transportation source or after. In the case of biogas, biogas is a renewable fuel. It consists roughly 50% carbon um, dioxide and 50% methane, both of which are renewable sources, both of which are from the short-term carbon cycle and not from fossil energy. The CO2 component of that can be stripped and recovered and polished. It's typically at higher concentration. It's typically at lower temperature and it's relatively straightforward to se separate in a, in a membrane or other system and then polish. And then in turn, that can be then further cleaned or converted into a source such as dry ice or solid ice that can be then sold in the market. For post-combustion CO2 recovery, the challenge is you have very, very high temperatures and the concentration of CO2 is a lot lower. So compared to a, um, a pre-combustion source, you may have a uh, concentration of 50 to 100%. And in a post-combustion source, you're talking under 10%. So it's, it's more hard to recover that. That gas can be recovered or has historically been used in greenhouses. So greenhouses run that exhaust gas through a codinox system, and that recovers the, um, the CO2 and can be used as the growing hair for, for greenhouses, for example, to stimulate plant growth. Alternatively, it can go through an amine-based system and then recovered to very, very high standards and polishing, which can be used all the way up to human consumption. So ideally for, for carbonation of soft drinks, for example. So next I'll touch on some real world examples and case studies uh, of where this technology has been deployed. The first few we're gonna look at existing technologies, kind of more run of the mill, and then we're gonna move into next generation technologies. So firstly, this is uh, the Cold Water Board of Public Utilities in Michigan. It's a gas peaking station. It could be fueled by hydrogen, for example. In this, exam in th in this instance, it's fueled by natural gas. This natural gas, um, is used or used as a fuel to generate electricity when there is a mismatch in demand and supply of the energy grid. In addition, this is located next to a greenhouse and it's technically possible to recover the CO2 from the engine exhaust to support the growth of the nearby tomatoes. Another example, Seba Wing Light and Power, another municipality level uh, installation. This one generating both electricity and heat with the heat being supplied in a logical manner to a, a local manufacturing facility. Uh, and 7.7 .7 megawatts of power generated as and when required. In Massachusetts, we have a Schneider facility. This is a, a combined heat and power plant, a local generation source um, linked into a wider microgrid supplied by third parties. So here the CHP is able to balance the electrical and thermal needs of the site alongside other sources of power generation on site. From a wastewater perspective, very important for sustainable cities, um, huge amounts of wastewater globally. This is one of the more advanced and more forward thinking wastewater companies that we work with. Um, here, the biogas is generating uh, electricity and heat. And what this site is looking to, due to some power restriction, uh, export restrictions, is to also look to convert um, to create hydrogen using that surplus energy they have on site. And that energy, that, that, that hydrogen can then be fueled into the CHPs or it can be used for transportation or other sources. So next generation case studies, what, what are they and how do they look? Here's an example of one of the first levels of microgrid, a relatively simple microgrid um, in Boxburg, South Africa. That's a, a major dairy called Danon. Uh, here, the 
gas engine. The um, engine is being used to generate electricity and heat on site, delivering a 90% CO2 reduction, but also then linked into solar PV uh, and optimized accordingly. There isn't energy storage on this particular site. There are backup gen sets as well. This is kind of a, 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 an initial level of complexity for a microgrid. A more complex microgrid is one here being developed in Middletown in Connecticut. This is a repurposed middle school, which is now a recreation center. Here, a combined heat and power engine links to solar, links to energy storage and backup gen sets, all integrated and optimized. And another good news story about this particular site is it acts as a weather shelter for uh, severe weather incidents for the homeless community um, as, as and when required. This site is an advanced biogas organic waste processing site. Here, it's generating renewable electricity, renewable heat, and renewable natural gas. So there's large volumes of natural gas, on renewable natural gas going into the grid, helping to de decarbonize the local network. And then also a combined heat power engine or a series of combined heat and power engines generate electricity and heat for the on-site requirements of this, um, this, this facility. An advanced thermal system. So here we have a greenhouse. Uh, the greenhouse um, has a combined heat and power engine generating electricity and heat in a standard kind of way, along with uh, CO2 recovery from the engine exhaust enriching the grow year. Now what takes it to the step further is surplus electricity uh, is used to drive water source heat pumps. So you see there's a series of pontoons floating on a lake. The electricity drives those um, heat pumps and extracts roughly five to six times the level of um, heat as the electrical load that's put in. And that helps to develop a 30% carbon saving compared to similar sorts of installation. Uh, a recent grant announcement from the Department of Energy, uh, one of our previously sister companies, the Cola Casa Grande um, development, you know, Cola's largest new manufacturing facility for their kitchen and bathroom product. Here, the DOE have announced support of a thermal microgrid, i.e. generating electricity. Um, that electricity comes from solar, storing it in long duration energy storage, potential to also support with um, some peak shaving. And this is all enabling a 90% CO2 reduction for their thermal energy sources on the site. And then finally, with the data centers, this is uh, you know, a new hyperscale data center. The challenges for data centers is finding sufficient power. Here, they're using natural gas to generate electricity. Um, and the opportunity in the data centers and the opportunity for sustainable cities is to link that, that, that power source with combined heat and power in particular and create more sustainable heating developments for that, for that locality. And on the advanced scale and in France, here is an example of a, of a, of a bio CO2, so renewable CO2 being recovered from a, a biogas plant with quite a degree of impact, um, creating dry ice from that CO2, so solid carbon dioxide, which can then be sold as a product and it's got high value. In the US, here is an example of Liberty Coca-Cola. Liberty Coca-Cola have identified or have a requirement for CO2. They say if there's no, there's no biz, if there's no fizz, um, CO2 driving that, that, that fizz for the, for the soft drinks. So here, they've taken it on themselves to self-generate electricity, self-generate heat, self-generate cooling, and then also recover the CO2. So this is quad generation, electricity, heat, cooling, and CO2 recovery. With the CO2 re recovered to drinks grade standards, and to be used as carbonation in the soft drink. So that was my uh, example of how distributed energy can fit into the sustainable cities development. If you'd like to get in touch, please use the contact details below. Thank you very much.